Well, good afternoon. My colleague sitting in the back. Oh, I just got the, let me do my joke first before we do that. <laughs> my colleague sitting in the back, can you hear me okay? Can you see me also? You can. Here is the boost. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is interesting, right? There's a little difference between Ambassador Arun Singh and me in my height, okay? <laughs> now I'm equal. <laughs> this, is, this makes a difference, I tell you. My self-confidence has gone up now, interestingly, so height makes a difference, obviously. I always start my opening about my name. My name is Jagdish Sheth, we know how to pronounce it, but when I went to the States, 1961, but became a faculty in 63 at Columbia University. All my colleagues were non-Indians, and they did not know how to pronounce our names in those days. So one of my colleagues told me, we don't know how to pronounce Yagdish, Jagdish, etc. So we'll call you Jag, like in Jaguar. <laughs> and ever since that association, I've been dreaming of owning a Jaguar with a license plate, Jags Jag. And the dream became a reality 20 years ago when I turned 60. I'm 80 now. Do I look 80? No. That's because I'm in marketing, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Diplomacy will age you. <laughs> in marketing, the first thing we learn, it's all about packaging, right? <laughs> but true story, I have two children. They are married. And I used to talk about Jag as in Jaguar and they surprised me on my birthday. I don't count my birthdays. I come from the old generation. I went out Saturday morning, I remember, to get my newspaper, turn around and saw this beautiful Jaguar, XJ model, the top of the line, even the color I liked, parked in the driveway with a handwritten license plate, Jag, Jag, happy 60th birthday. It turned out to be a rental car. <laughs> True story. I'm still looking for my Jaguar. <laughs> but here is the irony that Ambassador Singh was mentioning. British official car was Jaguar. Every diplomatic assignment or every diplomatic uh, outpost, they had to use Jaguar, which is interesting. It is now owned by an enterprise from an ex-colony called Tata Motors. Isn't that interesting? The world has changed that much. And management, therefore, has to adapt to that world. Uh, many years ago, I wrote a book, Why Good Companies Fail. Great journey for me. It came from the most insightful question I've been ever asked by any chairman of a large company on a one-on-one -on -one coaching conversation. And he said, Jag, do you know why good companies fail? And I said, I don't know. I never thought about it. I thought companies never fail. Humans have a finite life. Companies are eternal. That was what I was taught. That is what I taught others, interestingly. And suddenly then I began to look at the data, and I found that the average life expectancy of large corporations listed on New York Stock Exchange is now down to four and a half years. London Stock Exchange, the FTSE index, as it is called, which are the large corporation, is about the same. With more mega mergers now, if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, those that were eminent are just not there. The latest casualty is General Electric. Unthinkable. Ten years ago, Nobody would have thought that GE would be almost getting out of business. But that was true of Sears Roebuck. That was true, in fact, in retailing. That was true, in fact, of uh, uh, interesting Kodak as a brand name, again. It's fascinating. So I began to analyze and learn quite a lot in the process, and I found most companies are unable to sustain or survive if they are unable to adapt unwilling or unable to adapt to changing environment. And one of the key drivers of change is technology, which is the focus of today's talk primarily. 
And if the companies are not able to transition from the analog to the digital technology, you see disruptions by Amazon on the one hand in the retail scene, even the mightiest of the companies like Walmart have to look at it differently. Or if you don't look at the technology in the right way, disruptions, you see companies that are arising like Uber. Uber is transforming the industry completely from outside in. So that's the main presentation I will make, that each technology has had consequences on society, but definitely consequences on management. So let me take my clicker out, which I have it in my pocket. Hopefully I'll know how to use it. So the first slide is the following. Let's see, am I pointing here? Okay. Thank you. So here's the first slide. Every technology has changed management practices and principles. The industrial age would be, I call it industry 1.0. Industrial revolution changed primarily production. That was the key intent. You have now from custom-made products to mass-produced products. Assembly line principles came, which Henry Ford really codified in a positive way. Made products in the process more affordable, such as Kodak camera, Model T car. He was designed the car for $400 so his own employees can afford the car. Automobile was otherwise in the luxury car category. Timex revolutionized the whole watchmaking, same through automation primarily. We invented scientific management principles by Frederick Tyler, you might know in management, always talked about time and motion studies. We taught and we studied those things. We recently, we have talked about the TQM, and of course, Six Sigma became very much the norm, thinking about, again, part of the production area. Lean operations is the latest one that Toyota codified four major processes just in time, for example, TQM, customer orientation, cycle time, etc., and codified Toyota way of doing things. And this is why Toyota became number one car maker, surprising General Motors or Ford. That was unthinkable only 20, 25 years ago. But they led the way primarily about using the technology. And of course, in this particular case, the emphasis was on fixed capital. Whoever had the fixed capital, the capacity to invest made the difference. So we shifted from labor to capital primarily, and there were railroad barons who made money. There were steel magnets who made money. Automobile assembly line guy like the Ford made money, et cetera, et cetera. It is basically primarily automation of production or automation of factory. Now, industry dot two is very different. It now migrates toward what I call the, it's an infrastructure age, where the focus was building railroads, highways, trucks primarily on the road became the main vehicle to distribute the product. So this is really the, from production, the emphasis now shifts by technology to distribution where there were inefficiencies or lack of capacity, even just to expand the capacity. For the first time, we heard the concept of make it here and sell it there, market it there. That was very fascinating. By the way, I have done sustainability work, and I've come out with a very different angle. World was just fine before the Industrial Revolution, and it made two major mistakes. First one was to disassociate production and consumption from the same location and the same time. We produced a lot more here, therefore we had to seek market some other place. That divorce between production and consumption has created more carbon footprint than anything else. Just keep that in the back of your mind. We say that if you can bring the production and consumption back together somehow in a more contemporary, modern way, we might be able to reverse actually, not just reduce the global warming phenomenon. It is within our capacity which is a controversial theory because people believe it cannot be changed. But my view is that just like a heart disease, you can reverse it. Second thing is much more interesting. 
I suddenly began to realize that nature is biological, no matter whether those are corals on the one hand or coal mines on the other hand, they're all biological species. And if the biological species, if you abuse, creates a passive resistant. So the slowdown of the prosperity at dimension, either through public policy or private sector initiatives, will be neither the technology nor the capital, as we thought always the barriers for emerging economies, it is the nature or the environment. Environment will make you slow down. Because as anything that's a living, breathing species, when you abuse it, always reacts by passive resistance. We have seen this in animals. We have seen it in human beings, for example. So it's very important to understand that nature is no longer inorganic element as we thought about it in the first industrial revolution, but it's a living, breathing entity. And I just came back from Galapagos Island, for example, where Darwin began to discover about the natural selection theory, which I'll talk about later on. In artificial intelligence may actually shift that from a natural selection. Nature has a way of weeding out naturally among the mutations of species. If we intervene behind and it's man-made selection, what are the consequences on society? And management is actually responsible for those consequences. So this is the infrastructure age. The third one turns out to be primarily what I call the information age, where I've done a lot of work for the telephone industries and the government and the policy documents, both in the US as well as in other countries. Information age, as it is often called, or ICT is what I like to call, change the way we do commerce. Production, physical distribution, now we are thinking about trade and commerce, engage. Telephones, television, computers, and the internet mobile phones revolutionized, which we are still experiencing. <coughs> For the first time, we saw the rise of credit cards, which is a very important element that's coming in to our commerce doing trade. Of course, and now the e-commerce. So companies like Flipkart, Amazon, Snapdeal, Alibaba, they're all part of this ICT revolution that we see right now. Data became now mobile. Data were no longer in one place, but I could distribute and use the data all over, data mobility. We finally have the internet and the broadband aspect of the internet getting into the mobile phones, which is creating an enormous change in the society. And of course, online ordering is now in place pretty much. Most of the stuff we do with airlines, with banks, et cetera, is becoming online and they will mandate online. Online would be the only option, and if you want to do anything or not online, you have to pay extra price. Opposite, we think, right? Now here is the credit capital, and the first one was the capital, second basically equity capital, next one is the debt capital. This is the debt capital around here, that's very key. So now we are talking about the production or economy of transactions primarily. Now we come to the industry, dot 4.0 or 4.0, which is the knowledge age, as I call it, just a name. People will coin better phrase. This is where artificial intelligence comes in. It's very powerful technology. It's tried to mimic the mind in many ways, both the cognitive side and the memory side. Data mining is another key area as a part of the whole thing. And business insights, which is the early crude stages with artificial intelligence, I can get more insight than any other possibilities. Very useful, of course, in cybersecurity, anti-terrorism, and all those government military uses in some fashion. However, in the management area, biggest impact is going to be primarily social media. The largest nation in the world is no longer India or China. It is a nation called Facebook Nation. Two billion people living together. Jurisdiction is gone. It is across legal jurisdictional boundaries. How does that nation behave? That has lots of management implications. So artificial intelligence is just one element. Knowledge mobility now as opposed to data mobility, as opposed to people mobility, as opposed to product mobility. So knowledge mobility will become very key around here and how that will impact the management. I'll come to the implications in a moment. And please, 
like artificial intelligence, I am very curious about blockchain. Not the cyber currencies, but the underlying technology blockchain will make more transformation, probably as big an impact as we look down 30 years from now as internet has done. Internet has changed our lives. Blockchain will do exactly the same, maybe more powerfully. And artificial intelligence and blockchain will go together. Convergence will take place is what I see. So let me just talk about the side effects of these. Uh, this is actually, I'm writing a book, almost finished. I've been working on it for about a decade, what I call the seven side effects or the dark side of the internet. Okay. Fascinating. I never thought about some of the side effects. Digital addiction, everybody knows, so we have done research on that one. But here is very interesting. The first one is virtual becomes real. When virtual becomes real, what happens to society and therefore management? Whether those management principles are customer-centric, employee-centric, supplier-centric, investor-centric, is virtual reality much more fascinating to humans than real world? It is going to happen. Very important area. I know, for example, people who actually have go to the second life. They will go to Farmville. They are more obsessed about living in that virtual world than the real work here. So the impact is not as much by the industry themselves, but the users of this technology. So we have to understand the user mentality about how artificial intelligence and those platforms visiting those virtual communities is becoming very real just like video games. Have you seen those games that they come out with? The first day release alone will be billion dollars of revenues. Knows no boundaries. People are waking. Pokemon Go, remember that one? People actually kill themselves. That's where the impact will be, not in the management as much. So let's watch that thing. I'm very fascinated about that one. In the other area around here is very interesting, and I'll come to that later on. But I find that the technology already we have, and artificial intelligence will augment all that, is what I call the rise of the roommate nation. In the educated class like what we have in the audience here, we all behave like roommates in the family today. Married with children, nobody has time to eat together anymore. People come from a nation of diners, we become a nation of grazers. People like to eat standing up. They have no time to eat and enjoy each other. I know in my own family, my grandchildren, they come and go first of all, but more importantly, everybody after a meal, immediately one is text messaging, one is watching YouTube, one is doing conversation, and I have photos taken where they're sitting next to each other text messaging. And I thought that was the young generation. Then I have a photo where my kids have taken a photo where I am doing the same thing and my wife is also text messaging. <laughs> WhatsApp is very addictive. I never knew WhatsApp, but two years ago, somebody discovered to say, you must be on WhatsApp to make these free calls internationally. And now I find I'm curious about all of those videos people send me in the groups, fascinating. It keeps you more engaged and occupied than any television program. Isn't that interesting? That's a change. So rise of the roommate nation, then what happens to the family structure, which is a key unit of analysis and understanding in a society as one has an enterprise as a unit of analysis, government as a unit of analysis. Very interesting. And the next generation of young people have forgotten the art of cooking, cleaning, and childcare. Biggest outsourcing in America, and I'm sure it's going to happen in India, it's a matter of time, it's a global universal phenomenon, is outsourcing at home, not IT services to the Indian IT companies. These people don't know how to cook. So in America, one and a half meals are eaten away from the home, and the one and a half meals that we eat together Today, 50% are all made by somebody else, they just deliver you. 
ready to eat, not ready to serve, ready to prepare. Last one little work we don't want to do anymore. So we've forgotten the art of cooking, art of cleaning the same way. And there's a very interesting law, as good as a Newton's law or Einstein's law, which says anything you give up as a main activity always comes back as a hobby. <laughs> interesting. Hunting, fishing, gardening, baking breads. Have you seen the popularity of the cable channel called, I think it's called Food Channel? You make ordinary cooks into celebrity chefs. Have you noticed them? They're just like stars, like movie stars. People you always are into hobby back again. It used to be a dividing line in America where the man will be in the basement or the garage workshop, you know, tools. And the wife will be in the kitchen. She would like to remodel the kitchen. Today, men are as much in the kitchen as women are. They don't want to cook daily, but they want to be weekend gourmet people. They want to show off their kitchen now, not their automobiles. Significant change. It's a part of this roommate family as a phenomenon, and therefore the whole nation behaves like that, what happens to the society. The third one is what I call uberization of markets. It's a real phenomenon which fundamentally says that people will stop owning things and will be more and more renting things. The whole capitalism was formed on the basis of ownership. What if you don't own? I don't want to own home, but I would like to go Airbnb. I don't want to own an automobile, but I would like to actually rent an automobile all the time. So Uberization is just the tip of the iceberg. We'll see more and more Uberization of many activities in society that has consequences. Digital addiction, we already know that stuff. In countries like South Korea, which is very significant digital addiction, as Japan is waking up to the same thing, China already is aware, China now has a, has a detoxification centers next to the cyber cafes. They're finding that this is a very addictive technology, changing the whole next generation of people because they don't have computers at home as much, so they go to a cyber cafe. Fascinating. Next area is one I'm doing quite a lot of work. In the digital age, which I've done significant work, I find there are no intellectual property rights, period. I can sit in a small corner with an Apple software, or a Sony software, those are the two platforms. And I can make a movie on my own so long as I have a story to tell. I can pick up all the images, videos, etc., and I own the movie. I'm the chef, make a meal, so the salt brand name called Morton, which is what we have, loses its identity and intellectual property. I use sugar, and the, again the same thing, Sugar brand name, whatever it is, loses its identity. I own it. There is no way the legal system based on patents, which is industrial age, can be sustained anymore. Artificial intelligence will make it worse as you go along. So the whole legal profession has to understand how to create new sets of governance mechanisms so whoever creates things has intellectual property rights and at least they share in the share of the revenue or somehow they manage it differently. Very big change. So the legal profession is obsolete in this technology. It was designed for the industrial age primarily. And these jurisdiction issues are not limited to intellectual property rights. Jurisdiction, as I said, if I'm a Facebook nation, I don't recognize any geographical boundary of any nation. I'm a citizen of Facebook. I have no concerns about America, who cares? What happens then when a citizen loses identity with his or her own nation? Which we keep it up with a flag, with a national anthem, for example, we repeat, etc. but the Facebook says, you belong to me, not to the nation of your birth. Significant change, right? So in stranded assets is the other area. I've done a lot of work in utility industries, both power industry and telecom. When you have so much of copper wire in the ground, and it is now totally made obsolete, most of the copper wire on the balance sheet of the corporations are still at a book value, small cost reduction, 
and therefore they have no value whatsoever. Most balance sheets of utility companies are overinflated in the process. There's not even a salvage value. So companies like AT&T, Verizon are migrating customers as fast as possible from the copper wire technology and hoping that they will survive in the process. Massive stranded assets are there in factories which are all going to become less valuable on the balance sheet. So I find balance sheets are generally more inflated. So when I analyze uh, corporations for investment or advice, I look at the balance sheet assets and what kind of assets are there. If they are industrial age assets, and by the way, this is a key issue for General Electric right now. Just keep that in the back of your mind as a comment. And the last one is very key, public acrimony. If you think we have some acrimony now, wait till what happens. Have you seen the acrimony in the public domain today? Starting with national leaders or international leaders, tweeting the messages, communicating, inflaming the audiences in a one way or the other. My interest here is on the management. I find fascinating that most senior leaders in a corporation who grew up in the old industrial age mentality thought that my personal life can be separated from my professional life absolutely not possible anymore. Memory is cheaper than paper today. Biggest revolution has not been the processor, microprocessor, but the memory chips. I can store today on my flash drive the whole encyclopedia. And I can even store down the road the whole library of Congress where all the books are deposited, for example. Very powerful device. So I can keep the memory forever without any cost. So any indiscretion I may have done some time ago, it is there. Only way out for leadership in the, in the management is prevention, not correction. Apologies won't be enough. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Give me about five, 10 minutes more. Fascinating. Most CEOs don't realize that. They think my personal life is a gated community. How I live is none of the business. But today, the two are totally blurred. In fact, I find fascinating myself that if I want to know what I did yesterday, I do a Google search on me. <laughs> and I find information that I had no idea I did it. There's so much of surveillance going on in society. Every retail store has now has cameras. Every neighborhood has cameras. If you're walking there, it is recorded by somebody. So in this age, what's going to happen to management, which is my now real present. This is the background, essentially. So these are the new contours of governance. Management is all about governance. And the governance of, is going to change fundamentally by artificial intelligence. Governance will shift with artificial intelligence primarily. The broadband activity and interconnectivity will be supp supplementing to that one. Will shift from a hierarchical government, uh, gov governance we have today so you have the chairman of the board, managing director, then you have the vice presidents and the CEOs, and down the road, that system becomes obsolete. Governance will be actually distributed governance, which is why blockchain is very key, because it allows the distributed governance, essentially. Checks and balances will be already built in. No government can do checks and balances better than blockchain for our information. And governance will shift from externally governance, either by, for example, uh, the uh, public policy as a governance mechanism, governance becomes more and more self-correcting, self-improving, self-analyzing, etc. fundamentally. So this is a very interesting change, and I'm glad you asked me to talk about this one because it codifies whatever knowledge I have. So let me go through, here are the issues and the consequences. The first major consequences would be human capital will command premium. I am the contrarian to all of these doomsday theories about artificial intelligence creating labor surplus. No technology has ever done it, period. It shifts. Please, keep that in the back of your mind. Think about what factory worker commands US data. On the average, it would be about $25, fully loaded cost, including fringe benefits and all that stuff. Knowledge worker today commands in the US $100 at least. 
So average wage hours have gone up with age, technology age. Humans have become more premium commanding than the uh, agricultural age, which was the worst age possible for humans. You were to basically bonded labor or slaves for that matter, had no life. There was no weekend off, there was no Sunday. Compare that to what we do today, so humans will move up to the next evolution, mm -hmm. commanding a higher and higher wages, which is contrary to expectations, pretty much. A nation that doesn't shift, or a company that doesn't shift, is likely to be caught trapped in the, in the transition, primarily. So that's what I wanted to mention. I do believe very strongly there will be a rise of contract work. The employer-employee relationship was established for the industrial age. The bonding was for the agricultural age. In the tomorrow's age, essentially the knowledge age, I'm a freelance. I don't want to work for you, please. Remember, my parents, when they grew up, of course, they were more merchant community, but their counterparts, you started your job with a company and you retired with that company. Think about that, right? And you were very loyal to the company after retirement. I was a Tata person. I was a Birla person or whatever the names were. Today, young people don't even want to stay with you for more than two, three years. Contract work appeals to them. That's Uberization phenomenon on the supply side. So the traditional relationship between employer and employee will be less and less. Contract work will become more and more. And the governments haven't understood that because they rely on pension plan money coming through Social Security, in our case, for example, as a way of the retirement. Now here is General Motors data, which are so surprising because they never changed from the old model about negotiating with unions. They had a model where their nine new workers will fund one retiree. There was no end to getting premiums to support a retiree. Today, for nine retirees, there is only one new person contributing toward the pension plan. The most bankrupt today in America is not any corporation and the legal obligations for uh, pension plans and health care benefits, which is why they declared they have to declare Chapter 11 just to survive. But the most bankrupt nation today is in the U.S. for Social Security obligations. We cannot meet them. They're just in a denial stage. By 2030, number of people contributing to Social Security will decline, so we'll have to figure out how to tax people when they work as contract workers because they don't contribute to our Social Security. Massive impact. Contract work will appeal to people, not to the corporations. Today we think corporations want contract work. It is actually the employees or the people who have a knowledge simply say, I don't want to work for you. I don't want a boss anymore. And I'll talk about that in about a minute. That's fascinating. I'm totally convinced about that one. Third one is something that, Mr. Bhattacharya, you mentioned, which is very, very key. And this is a movement that has begun behind the scenes, which is, which is conscious capitalism. It starts surprisingly on a book that my colleague and I wrote called Forms of Endearment, where we talked about shareholder value obsession is a very short-lived phenomenon well, family established companies were never shareholder driven, they were stakeholder driven. I observed that when I went to visit corporate headquarters located in small towns like Kohler, where they make these uh, sanitary appliances, you know, for, for uh, toilets and all that stuff. I worked at Whirlpool Corporation in a small town called Benton Harbor, Michigan, where the family lives in the community. Every Sunday, the church is a great equalizer. You are not about God, no matter who you are. You are more respected, you are given the frontline seat. At the church Sunday, you have to show up. Your neighbors are your managers. You have to, across the fence, talk to them. Neighbors' children go to the same school as your children or grandchildren, depending on the age. You have to be community-oriented, whether you like it or not. And we corrupted that system by relocating corporations where the capital markets were there, which is New York, London, etc. They forgot their roots. General Electric moved from a small town where it grew up so well to ultimately New York City. 
IBM is in Armonk, which is where the soul and heart is. Now they're relocated in New York to be part of the capital markets, and they're corrupted by the capital markets. It is not the corporations who corrupt themselves. It is the capital markets who corrupt corporations. Isn't that interesting? Analysts take over your life. Annual budget is still annual predictable, but the CEO of a company does not know whether he will survive next quarter. Isn't that fascinating again? There is no predictability of job security at any level in a corporation, which is again very key about loyalty and bonding. So shared value creation, as Michael Porter has talked about, is becoming mainstream where the sustainability goals become part of that agenda. Triple bottom line, as we call it generally, which is prosperity as opposed to profit. Profit is a dirty word, please. It carries the same negativism as the N word in America does. We don't allow to use it anymore. We said that the stock market has to use different measures than the profits and the accounting system has to change from a governance point. Next area is greater empowerment with greater accountability. I did a lot of work on this one. I'm very fond of account uh, empowerment. Empowerment allows less management overheads. You know, it's very pro positive. People like to be in charge. They don't like boss to tell them what to do every time. Sort of nitpicking, you know, or overlooking the shoulders. Young people hated that. So we go for empowerment. Give more power to the frontline people. I found fascinating that one third of the people don't want to be empowered. They don't want to be, which was a shock. Other one third of the people cannot be empowered because they're incompetent. Why? Because the human resource policy is what? You start front line someplace, then those who are good are moved up, who is left behind? We have never invested in the front line capital in terms of improving them constantly. They are basically creating a caste system between the front line, let's say customer support people. How many CEOs have come in the corporation from customer support organization? That's the most front line. We see some from HR function nowadays, which is a frontline HR people managing internal people, et cetera, fascinating. So only one third are capable, and the reason is primarily it's our selection. We think we'll fix it by training. It does not happen. Selection is more important than training, which is what I find, so it's very interesting. And how do we reverse the pyramid where the frontline are more respected in the organization than the man management at the top? That's called servant leadership in the Christian faith, for example. Servant leadership has lots of very positive attributes, and we are now training CEOs to behave like servant leaders rather than tra traditional bosses. And I'm sorry if I'm running over time, so I will compress my time. It's just somebody has to manage my time, because I'm on the podium. I have no idea when to get off the podium. Okay. The next area is very interesting. This is already happening. Social media will replace press media as the judge and the jury. Think about that one. And social media is more global than the press. Press is a lot local, generally. This will change the whole thing. Have you seen the Me Too movement globalizing? Every nation, every corporation, people are waking up and say, enough is enough. All of a sudden, you create a movement out of nothing through social media, which was not possible by press because press had an editorial control that decided what to publish and what to print and what not to print. That's not the case in social media. This will have a huge management consequences. When social media becomes the judge and the jury, what happens to management? I believe profit sharing is an old idea. More and more, people will demand revenue sharing because Profit, I can create optics through my accounting systems by allocating costs. Revenue is more transparent, and therefore a percent of revenue, which is Uber system, is revenue sharing, not profit sharing. Nothing to do with the stock ownership. Those are old models that we created during industrial age that are about to be replaced now. And the next point is the key one, which I'll conclude again. Style of management for leaders is going to be no longer the authoritarian chair gives me the power to do what I want to do to my employees, to my subordinates. Those days are gone or will be gone. 
The new style of management that leaders have to embrace is what I call coach and a mentor. Have you seen the coaching in sports? But the coach is not as well known as the player. I don't know who coaches cricket team in India, but I know player names. So is true in football, so is true in basketball. Coaches subordinate themselves. They are not in the limelight. Current leadership is always, they want to be in the limelight, not the people who do all the work. How do you get human potential out is very key, new approach. And young people only like coaches. There are surveys after surveys. Boss is hated at every level in the organization. Okay? The vice presidents hate the CEO. The assistant vice president hate the vice presidents. Managers hate the assistant presidents, goes on all the way to the factory worker. Fascinating. So that's a new style of leadership that we'll have to encounter, embrace. Point number eight, again, trying it very much between the first two speakers is CSR is not an afterthought, please, or guilt reduction, or what's called strategic initiative, or a strategic investment, which says, let me do damage to the environment, to the people, but now I pay. Nobel Prize came out of that. Please, it's the way you do business every day. Totally change. So CSR is not a side activity. While well, it's mandated in India, and I know all the stuff, and I think the latest numbers I calculated, given the amount that is there, it's about $5 billion of surplus that one has to invest. It now becomes a part of doing business. That's how I believe myself as a system. And if the universities cannot teach that, how can I have an employee training where I say that's the value system, triple bottom line from the day one that you come in. We always provide corporate culture every time we employ people. How do we put that thing? Public policy will be more strategic than public relations and external affairs. Corporations always have external affairs people. Public policy is more important. I have not seen anybody in a large organization who is a chief policy officer. There are some symptoms of large corporations engaging them. I cannot give the names right now, unfortunately. But it's very fascinating. Suddenly the shift is more toward public policy rather than managing the politicians or the regulators, for example. Information technology will be like breathing air it will be everywhere. Get used to it. That's it. <clears throat> and of course, like any air, some may be more dirty than the others. And how do we make sure that the air is more clean, which means the data that we collect, the data that we store will be more clean. So I'll just conclude quickly. Every technology influences and alters the contours of management, period. We know that. The industrial age altered the contour of production. Infrastructure age altered the contour of physical distribution, logistics. Information age altered the contours of commerce. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, and social media will alter the contours of governance. As I mentioned, governance will shift from hierarchical core to distributed and from external government by public policy or by management, like the owners saying, this is my governance policy, to more and more self-governance. Implications for future of management will be enormous. Human capital will command premium, contrary to all the expectations, and contract work will become the new norm. Rise of conscious capitalism will expand. And by the tell you that book, Forms of Endearment, was written by Raj Sisodia, my colleague, with uh, John Mackey, who is the founder of Whole Foods, called Conscious Capitalism. There's a whole movement going on worldwide where CEOs of the companies are beginning to understand they can't survive unless they contribute back to the society. It's not a one-way street, as many people have thought. Very fascinating. It's really catching on, which is a nice, pleasant feeling. And it goes back to my comment, the shareholder value is only 30-year detour from that family-owned businesses located in small towns. It's only 30 year history of shareholder value obsession that we created primarily after the first energy crisis began to really evolve. We created formulas like CVA, for example, you know, all the stuff we did 
but it's now on the way out back again, which is fascinating, right? So I will take the last slide because of the time and talk about fundamental punchline about governance. Final thought. Successful leaders will, do, will be those who embrace and use coach mentor style of leadership in place of the traditional boss style of leadership and management. People will not work for you. Here are the statistics. Today's young generation, which is the future human capital, in Singapore, where is such a low unemployment, I go there in many reasons, advising and all that. You do so much of research on one particular hire, you invest all the person, all the resumes, you invite for interviews after interviews, you make an offer, the person joins you, at the end of the day, he says, I leave. You do exit interviews, he says, why? I just don't like it here. No explanation. Our students at Emory University, first question they ask to the, they say, I want to talk to vice president, not the recruiter, first of all. And they ask the question, what are you doing for environment? The boss who is going to hire has no answer. Isn't that interesting? And they simply say, why would I work for you? See the change? It's just amazing. This young people mindset is so different. And why it has happened? Because they come from affluent families. They always find after high school when they leave home, their bedroom can be never touched by the family. I cannot convert that into my office, for example. I cannot convert that into extra room. They want to come back. They are a yo-yo generation. They leave and they come back. They don't worry about their livelihood. Because they have a safety net at home that changes their autonomy and their mindset. So the future of governance is a lot more distributed, a lot more the way as a leader we'll have to manage would be mentor and a coach style. We say, how do I get more potential out of you, which is good not only for you, but also for the corporation. Thank you very much.